uh, we're, we're in the third week, actually the last week of, of uh, our Walk Across the Room series. And we've been talking about what it means for us to share Christ uh, with, with others and how important that is. And one of the key elements in this is for you to recognize that you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. The Bible is, is handy. It's good. I mean, it, it inspires us. It motivates us. It equips us in many ways. But the Bible is not the salt of the earth. Uh, worship is great, motivating and inspiring. Worship is not the salt of the earth. Pamphlets and books can give information, but they are not the salt of the earth. The scripture says very clearly that you, the body of Christ, that's you guys, you are the salt of the earth. And if people are to experience life and, do, and to experience the kingdom of God, it's going to come through you. It's through you that God is going to work. And we have to understand that and recognize that. And if, if, we will, if we will follow the example of Christ and be willing to step out of our circle of comfort and walk across the room, which simply means becoming aware of the people around us, kind of being willing to just listen to the Spirit of God as you go about the routine of your day, not being just simply caught up in the little things, but keeping it open. God, who do you want me to speak to? Who do you want me to talk to? Who do you want me to make a move over? Who do you want me to discover their story, to build a relationship with? God, I'm just listening to your Spirit all through the day. When we're, when we're willing to follow the example of Christ and walk across the room for us, others, we see lives being changed all around us. We said last week that you have a story and that your story is powerful. You have a before I came to know Jesus, you have a when my relationship with Jesus deepened or, or I came to, to meet Jesus, and you have what my life is like now that I know Jesus or I know him in a deeper way. Every one of us has a story, and learning to tell that story is a powerful part of God using us to bring others who are far from him close to him. And man, I asked all you guys to email me your story last week, and a bunch of you did, and I just want to say thank you. Your story is powerful. I, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of Mondays, I'll, I'll uh, go down to Mocha Joe's for a little while and uh, have, a, have a coffee and uh, sit there and kind of start my reading up on my emails and kind of figuring out what my week looks like. And I sat in Mocha Joe's on Monday, and man, I, I want to tell you something. I just cried as I read the stories. And, and I, didn't, I didn't cry because the stories were sad, though some of them were, were sad in, in many ways. I cried because, man, I just saw the power of God at work in such a wonderful, amazing way. I mean, I just heard people after people say, man, this was my life, and then I, I met Christ, or I, I came to grace, or I deepened my walk with Christ, and now I'm experiencing this. And I heard it again and again and again. Man, it was just, it was just emotional morning just simply reading those stories and seeing that God can do this. Man, the power of God at work. I mean, it just, it just rolled me over. I'm just blown away. And just, man, thank you to you guys who sent me your story. To those of you who didn't, uh, there's still time. Now, you won't get full credit uh, because it's late. I can't do anything about that. There are consequences to your actions. Uh, but there is still time to send me your story, and I would love to hear how God is at work in your life. A lot of people said, my story is not very powerful. I want to tell you, every story was powerful. Every story was powerful. And God has equipped you guys with some powerful stories to change lives. And we just need to recognize that and be prepared to share our story with others. Uh, today I want us to invite us uh, to live life at another level, uh, to go deep in life. I, I want you just, just for a moment, imagine with me that it's a beautiful day and you're out somewhere in the middle of the ocean over a coral reef. Just one of those nice places where they take you out there. And, and imagine with me that it's one of those days when the ocean is fairly calm. There's not much waves, and, and you're kind of out there, and you're floating on your back in the middle of the ocean. All right? and, and it's salty, so you're not having to try to swim very hard. All right? So you're just kind of laying there, kicking back. All right, you've got to close your eyes to get this. Close your eyes for just a minute. All right, your eyes are closed. You're just kind of laying back there. You're just kind of floating in the ocean. It's calm, it's nice, it's a beautiful day. The sun's kind of coming in and out of the clouds. It's not too bright, it's not hurting your eyes. Uh, and you kind of take a look to the side. And, and when you look to the side of you and you're, you're floating there and you look across that, that calm ocean, I mean, everything is calm, it's tranquil, it's beautiful. I mean, you're just kind of laying there and it's just so peaceful out there. It's just kind of just barely kind of going up and down with some little bitty waves. and It's nice and peaceful. On your head, you've got one of those masks, and so, so now I want you just to pull down that mask over your eyes, and, 
and take that big snorkel thing and, 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 and kind of put that snorkel thing in your mouth, and I want you just to roll over. And, and when you roll over here, you're going to roll over, and you're going to look down into the water, and you're looking down upon this beautiful coral reef. I mean, it's just exploding with color. I mean, there's all sorts of things. And, and when you look at that coral reef, suddenly you see, man, there, there are tons of fish down there, and, and they're swimming, darting in and out. You see one of those big moray eels coming out, and, and you look around, you see these huge schools of fish swimming, and they kind of move all at the same time. They're just darting around, and because it's shark week, you see a big shark kind of swimming through all these kinds of things. It's not going to eat you. It's okay. You're just kind of looking around there, and seeing all this kind of stuff. And then, then you look up, look up back out of the water again and kind of look across the surface of the ocean. It's calm. It's peaceful. It's tranquil. Look back under the water again, and what do you see? I mean, there's the exploding color in the fish and everything. You look up again on the top of the surface. Everything is calm, and it's flat. You look under again, and man, boom, exploding with life and things going on. and It's just incredible. And listen, here, now you can look up at me. You can open your eyes. Listen, some of us, God wants us to live beneath the surface of life. God is calling you to go deep. And when you go deep in life, you discover that life is not simply about getting by. Life is about being equipped by God to bring somebody else who's far away from him close to him. Life's about helping lost people get found. That's what life's about. And you can live life on the surface. You can make it about making a living. Or you can go deep and discover that God wants to do something with your life that, 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 that is amazing, that is miraculous, that God wants through you to change destinies. God wants to take you below the surface, to live life where all the action is. That's what God wants to do. And since we're, since we're in the ocean already, we can tell a fish story. Uh, here in Luke chapter 5, um, Jesus is calling those first disciples, and we read this story. One day, Jesus, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Listen, Peter and James and John, they've had a long day of fishing, long night of fishing. They're kind of hanging out and, and kind of mending their nets, kind of just being there. And Jesus comes along the seashore and needs a place, a platform from which to preach. And so he climbs into, into, into Simon's boat, and they push out from shore. And Jesus preaches for a few moments. And, and when he's done preaching, he says to Simon, Hey, you know what? Let's go out to the deep water. And let down your nets. Simon says, man, we've already tried this, Jesus, but if you tell me to, I'll do it. And so they push out into the deep water. They let their nets down over the side. And then suddenly, when he begins to pull them back up again, they are so full of fish that they can't bring them up by themselves. I mean, the net's just bursting. It's just tuggling on it. And so they call out their friends, James and John, to come and to help them bring these, all these fish into the boat. And as they begin to bring all these fish into the boat, the boat is getting so full that it's starting to sink. Now, now some of you like to fish like I do. And you've probably told people before, man, I caught so many fish, my boat was sinking. But you lied, all right? <laughs> this is the truth. <laughs> now, this time, there were so many fish in the boat that the boat's about to sink, and you can just see Jesus sitting over there going, man, this is good. You know, because he knows what's coming. You know, and he's just sitting there watching this, and, and the boat's feeling like it's about to sink, and, and suddenly Peter kind of catches on to what's going on. And Peter falls down and says, says Lord, get away from me. I mean, he, he, he realizes he's in the presence of God, and he says, man, I'm not worthy of this. And Jesus looks at Peter, and Peter says, and he says to Peter, Peter, it's okay, man. Get up. It's okay. And, and I can just imagine that the Bible doesn't always tell us the whole story, so I've got to add a little bit to it, you know, because you can imagine the, the whole story. I can imagine Jesus saying to, to, to Simon, you know what? That was fun, wasn't it? 
And Simon says, yeah, man, that was fun. I, I enjoyed it. That was great fun. And Jesus said, you know what? I got something better. Really? Better than this? Fill up the boat. Jesus says, yeah. I can make you a fisher of men. You know, we can, we can leave the six inches and go to the six footers if you want to. We can leave the surface where life is about making a living, and we can go deep where life is about making a difference. If you want to, if you'll follow me, we can do something better. And the scripture says that they get the boats to the shore and they pull them up on shore. And you can just imagine the scene on shore. There's all these people there crowding around looking at these boats. They're just, I mean, just full of fish. Something probably people have not seen before. And, and they pull them up all on shore and the crowd's gathering around. And people are patting Simon and James and John the back. Say, man, good job, guys. And, 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 and Simon says, who wants my boat? And everybody goes, what, what, what do you mean? Who wants my boat? I, I'm done. You what? I'm done. And they said, well, what do you, what do you do? I found something better. I found something better. I, I'm now going to go follow Christ. My life has been radically reoriented from simply making a living to making a difference. And, and so Simon and James and John, they began to follow Jesus Christ, and their life began to be lived at a deeper level. You know, and that's still what Jesus is looking for today. Jesus is still looking for some disciples who want to live life at that deeper level, who know it's not simply about getting by, but it's about making disciples. It's about sharing the love of Jesus Christ with other people. For the disciples, this meant that they had to leave everything and, and follow Jesus. But for most of us, that's not what it means. For most of us, it simply means that we have to look at life differently. We have to open up our eyes to how God wants to work around us right where we already are. We have to believe that God has equipped us in every way to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We have to believe that our story is powerful and can change lives. We have to believe that we are the salt of the earth and that if people are going to come to know Christ, it's going to be through me. We have to open up our eyes to the opportunities that God is placing around us right where we already are. We have to believe. We have to believe that God has, that everything that's happened in our past has been God equipping us to make disciples of Jesus Christ today. Everything that's happened in your past up to this moment, God is simply preparing the, those things so that you can introduce others to Jesus Christ today. God wants to use all that stuff from your past so that people who are far from him can come close to him. So that those who are lost can get found. Listen, if, if you don't like this, uh, if you don't like my sermon today, blame uh, Rebecca for uh, it's her fault. Uh, I had kind of a different sermon planned this week, and then she sent me her test, her story, and I read her story, and I was like, man, that's that's good. And I, and I just want her to come up here and and to uh, be up here with me for just no wait a second, Rebecca. I want you to stay right there for just a minute. Because first, I want you to kind of set this up a little bit before you come. I changed my mind. I want to set this up a little bit for you guys uh, from, from, from uh, Luke chapter 5 right here. I think it will go better this way. If you go and read a few more verses over in chapter 5, it says this. It says, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Now, Levi now has a story, right? I mean, Levi was a tax collector. He was despised. He was a no down, low down, dirty, rotten, scoundrel, traitorous person that nobody wanted to hang out with. Jesus walks by and says, Levi. And he calls him by name. He says, I want you to follow me. Now, Levi has a story, doesn't he? Man, I was despised. I was outcast. I was nobody. I was considered a traitor. I was considered, considered the, the worst enemy of the Jewish people. Then Jesus called my name. And, and now I'm walking with him, experiencing a total different life. Levi now had a story, but listen, the story was not supposed to end with Levi. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Levi was changed by Christ. And Levi probably didn't have a, a deep theology yet. He probably didn't have all the answers to all his questions, but he knew how to throw a party. Uh, and so he threw a party. And who came to Levi, the tax collector's party? Tax collectors and sinners. 
You know what? He was a tax collector, and, and who's he now able to reach? He invites them to his house that they might have uh, this moment with Christ as well. Everything in his past, in Levi's past, had equipped him to reach these people, these also people who were also outcasts, these people who were also on the outside. Levi was now equipped to reach them as well. And we see as we read that story that Levi was strategic in reaching a whole group of people. The good news of Jesus was not supposed to end with Levi. Levi was a strategic jumping off point where God wanted to reach a whole bunch of other people. The grace wasn't supposed to end there. I want you to recognize the same thing about your life. God's grace was not supposed to end with you. You are strategic for reaching a whole bunch of other people in life. And looking at our past gives us a great hint at the people that we're most able to reach. Rebecca, you want to try again? All right, come on up here. I, I just want you guys to, I, I, there are so many great stories, but Rebecca's fits really in just with what I'll share with you guys today. And, and, uh, all right. and, and just give you guys a little bit of background first. I just want Rebecca to share a little bit of her testimony, uh, especially with your husband, Steve, and around all that and how all that kind of stuff came about. Well, most of you know, or some of you know, um, because I've been going to church here for a while, that before I was married to Brent, who, thank you, Brent, for all your love and support. He's a wonderful man. Before Brent, I was married years ago to a man named Steve Pinter, who some of you also knew. And when I was pregnant with our second child, Nathaniel, he was diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And what that is, if you're not familiar with the disease, is it's terminal. There is no treatment. There is no cure. There's really nothing you can do, and it affects the nerves and the muscles in the body to the extent that they become weak and eventually paralyzed. So it results in paralysis of your legs, your arms, your hands, and eventually it affects your speaking, your swallowing, and your breathing. It leaves the person unable to communicate, but they're still mentally aware of what's going on. So it was a particularly devastating illness for a fairly young person to have, and it was difficult as his caregiver, and I was his primary caregiver, to watch that. And part of the story, my story, is that the only thing that equipped me to be able to handle that and to be strong for him and strong for my children and just strong and survive it was that God had prepared me for that and my faith and trust in God allowed me to be strong when I know my, in my selfish heart I could not have done otherwise what I was able to do for yeah. him. How long was it from when he was diagnosed with ALS before uh, Steve died, Rebecca? It was about three and a half years. Okay. So three and a half years that goes through all the stages of walker, scooter, wheelchair, can't feed himself, um, eventually communicating through things like eye blinks, and we had a spelling system that we were able to use near the end. Yeah. And, and you know what? This is one of the stories this week that just made me cry. I, I'm a crier, but the, I mean, just reading her story, and it wasn't, I mean, it was, it's a sad story, but reading your story and your, your testimony was really just what kind of blew me away was just simply the peace that God did give you through that. Right. I mean, that was, that was the incredible part, just that God, I mean, somebody going through something as difficult as this that's not over quickly, that, that's drawn out for such a long time. Right. Uh, to, to find strength and, and stuff. But it's not really your story that, that I haven't brought you up here for. I wanted you to know her story, uh, but that's, not the, that's just kind of the background. Uh, one of the things, what I want you to realize today is, is that your past has equipped you to be strategic in reaching a, a whole other group of people. And, and so one of the things that you do, you might say is the, right. uh, tell them what that is, the helpline or... When Steve was ill, I, got, I became aware of an online support group. It's called Living with ALS, where patients and caregivers get online and they share information about, I learned a lot about how the disease would progress, what equipment we would need, those type of things. But it's also a support group for caregivers and patients to vent their frustrations, to look for, for online support and encouragement from people who've been through the illness or are going through it. And you want to just set up how you sure. ended up writing this, and I'll hand this to you. Right. Um, well, when I was going through working on my story this week, that was the main thing that I got out of it was how I was able to cope with the illness and going through all that. And the very next morning, I went into my office, and the first post online was from a woman who was just crying out for help and said, how do I cope with losing my youngest son to this disease? Help. Yeah. 
And I, I knew then, because it was so on my mind, that before I did anything else in my day, I needed to reach out to her. Yeah, that's called walking across the room. That's called getting out of your circle. I bet you're busy. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I bet you have things to do at work. Right. All that kind of stuff. I mean, that's just kind of like keeping your head up. How's the Holy Spirit? Who's the Holy Spirit calling me to speak to? That's what we're talking about. Not going to, to Africa or the mission field. We're simply talking about just keeping your eyes open, your heart open to how the Holy Spirit wants to work. And so you responded, and I was just going to get you to read your response. Okay. I lost my husband to ALS, and it was hard for me to see any sense to his suffering and death. He was young and left behind two small children. The most important thing is to be with him and there for him as much as you can. That will bring you some measure of peace. Although it is a hard one, it is a journey you will never forget. Being there for someone who needs you as much as he does right now has the capacity to bring you closer to him than you would have ever been otherwise. Try to be strong for him if that is what he needs when he is with you and let him be weak with you. He may need to vent and yell or cry and sometimes that will be good for both of you. It will not be easy, but you will cope and do all the things you need to do. That will be a comfort to your son. Ask for help from family or friends. They may want to help, but not know what to do. Because you are here and asking the question, I know that you are the type of mother who will be a blessing to your son at this time. I can tell you that my ability to cope came directly from my faith and trust in God. He provided me with the strength I needed to get through it and to be fully there for my husband even when I was exhausted and scared. I could have never made it through this experience without relying on God. I know I did not have the capacity to do it on my own. My husband felt the same and we trusted God when we were weak. Steve's faith brought him great peace as he was nearing the end. We found our way and I will always cherish that time we had together. I hope this helps. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate you. You know what? That's what we're talking about right there. That's believing that my story can impact somebody else's story. And, and Rebecca's doing it right there. It's just simply knowing that when I look back over, that, that God has somehow, even through the hurt and the pain, that God's going to redeem it all. God's not going to waste a thing. God's going to redeem every tear that was ever shed, all the pain. The devil never wins in any of this. God redeems it and wants to use that to touch somebody else's life today. You are uniquely, when, you, when you're aware of your story, you also have become aware that you are uniquely equipped to touch some other people's lives. You know, the cool thing about Rebecca, too, is that she's not just kind of sitting around waiting. She's kind of taking that whole commandment of Jesus, go and make disciples. She's taking it seriously. She's kind of signed up, so she keeps up on the ALS site so that she can just kind of be looking for those who might need uh, an encouraging word. And God wants to do the same thing through you. I, uh, just, I, I just took a quick look at... Man, all the testimonies this week, I haven't got to respond to all of you, but I'll respond to every single person who sent me their testimony. Uh, and, and I just looked at the, at the unique circumstances of the different testimonies that, that, I, that I received this week. Uh, I had some people who grew up in church but never knew God. Some people experienced the pain of divorce. Some people who experienced life-changing accidents and illnesses. People who have struggled with parents people who were told they were no good. I had people who had suffered sexual abuse, physical abuse, people who struggled with drugs and alcohol, people who had what I just call an unfair life. Just bad stuff just keeps happening to them. I mean, just one after the other, and it's just unfair. I don't understand it. Life's just that way. I had people who, who struggled with the religion based on fear, people wounded by the church, uh, uh, stories of people wounded by a pastor, stories of the loss of loved ones, stories of people who spent years running from God, people who were sexually permissive, people who struggled with depression, people who struggled with stress, people who struggled with anxiety, folks who had been through rehab, folks who had spent time in prison, folks who had struggled with anger, folks who had struggled with fear, folks who had struggled with the loss of dreams, folks who had struggled with the loss of children, people who had uh, found Christ healing of job stress, uh, people who had struggled with hopelessness and found hope in Christ, people who were homeless. You know what? You look at all that, and, and those are unique stories to all the different people. And that's just a few of the stories I heard this week. And those unique stories, listen, God, you know, God hates that pain that you went through, but God wants to redeem that pain for somebody else. And you are uniquely equipped in some ways through, through your personal story. 
You're uniquely equipped to help somebody who's far from God find a way to be close to Him. I can't tell all those stories. I've got a story, but my story is not your story. You are uniquely equipped. You're strategic for a whole group of other people that God wants to reach. And when you believe that, you'll begin to live life beneath the surface, where life is adventurous and exciting and filled with purpose and hope and meaning. That's what God's calling you, just, just as he called those disciples so long ago. He's calling you. Walk across the room. You are the salt of the earth. You are those called to change destinies. God has equipped you for that. Believe in the purpose that God has placed within your life and allow God to work through you in a powerful way. Let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you. I thank you for your great love for us. Lord, I thank you that you've given us a story and that our story is caught up in your story. And we just praise you for that. Lord, we thank you for the grace that we found. And Lord, we just... We, we, we realize today that the grace was not supposed to stop with us. The story was not supposed to end with us. The good news was not supposed to end with us, Lord. Uh, like Levi, we are strategic, each and every one of us here. Lord, each and every one of us here, we're strategic for reaching a whole other group of people. Lord, we have a, a story that we uniquely are equipped to tell. And I pray that you would give us a passion for that story. Lord, open up our eyes as you did Rebecca's this week. Open up our eyes to see somebody in need that we are uniquely equipped to, to speak to. Lord, and help us to, to, to speak those words of grace and love that meant so much to us. Lord, help us to be equipped to share that with others as well. Lord, we thank you that it's not about us. It's not about us using the right words. It's simply about your Holy Spirit working through us. We praise you that our story is just the vehicle which you use to, 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 to change hearts and to touch lives. And we just give all that we are. Uh, to you and ask that you use us in a way to build your kingdom. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.